Thank you, sir. This is one of these pieces of Scripture that relies on some knowledge of another piece of Scripture in order to be uh, fleshed out a little, uh, a, a little more than if we didn't address uh, some of the, the references. We're in Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 9 through 15. And to identify a few folks uh, before we start reading, the John in this message is John the Baptist, and so that's your reference there. And I will be jumping to Matthew 4, uh, verses uh, 1 through 11, to just point out a few things for you once we get done with this piece of Scripture. And so let us read from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 9 through 15, and it reads as follows. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. So, in part of this, we're talking about the temptation of Christ. And Mark just basically says that he was sent into the wilderness, comma, tempted by Satan. So for those of you who aren't familiar with those temptations, Matthew's Gospel, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 11, explains them to you so that you'd actually know what and was tempted by the devil means. And so the three temptations that uh, occur in Matthew that are the same temptations that Mark writes of is that uh, Satan looked directly at, at Jesus and he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Right? Jesus is out in the wilderness. There's not food. There's not a whole lot of water. And he's hungry. And so Satan basically tells him, well then, there's some rocks. Go ahead if you're who you say you are. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. You want your angels come and help you out? You know, if you're truly the son of God, you can do that, right? Yeah? And he goes, Jesus had an answer for him. And then the third temptation was the devil took him to a very high mountain and he said, take a look at all this. And if you'll just bow down one time before me and proclaim me your king, you can have all that you see. So those are the temptations. I don't want to gloss over them. Mark glosses over them and not to not tell us what's going on. He just says, and he was tempted. So let's back up and let's take a look at, at some of these things. Um, we go straight from Christ's baptism to him being driven out into the wilderness. Now, for those of you who have witnessed a baptism, including, I hope, your own, if not, come see me and we'll deal with that issue too, right? It's a celebration. At some point, everybody gets joyful and happy and bouncing off walls, and usually there's a meal provided, and if not, then the family takes them to Red Lobster or whatever. It's a good time. It's a celebration. And in fact, even in Jesus's Baptism, there's a celebration, right? The heavens open up and the Holy Spirit descends upon him. How awesome is that? Well, right after that, the Holy Spirit drives him to the wilderness. So he goes from a state of bliss and perfection, and man, this is awesome, to go out in the wilderness for 40 days. Think about that. The Holy Spirit falls upon him 
and then drives him into the wilderness. We go from a glorious supernatural baptism to a true test of his divinity. The devil's putting him to the test because he wants to see, in fact, how divine he is. We often allow ourselves to get confused with this concept of baptism. Yes, we do celebrate it. And yes, we're thankful and we throw parties and it's a big time in people's lives. But we have to understand, while it is life-changing, it's not life situation changing. Right? We get caught up sometimes in what we've been baptized and I've been made anew and everything in my life is going to change. That's short-sighted. And in fact, we know that that doesn't come to pass. And so Jesus' time in the wilderness meant that he was in a spiritual place of wandering and hardship and uncertainty, right? I've just been baptized and the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit fell upon me and I know that I am the Son of God, the Son of Man, and this is a glorious time, yet maybe just maybe in wandering around for 40 days in the wilderness, you got to stop and think, well, wait a minute, if I'm the Son of God, why am I out here just walking around in the desert? Why are there challenges? And why in the world would my father put this clown, Satan, in my life to challenge me at least three times? In a time when I am going from this state of grace and this awesome scene to a place in which I'm not sure what's going on. There's no comforts here. And I don't see a whole lot of grace. It's a reminder to us that Jesus was very much a part of this physical world. This is a chance for us as Christians, as human beings, to take a look and say, while He was divine, He truly was a part of this world. He was hungry. And Satan knew it. And said, well, if you're hungry, just be God. Just turn those stones to bread. You're not asking much, right? Just do that. And yet, Jesus at that point was standing on His humanity, on His humanness, and said, that's not what my Father had put me here to do. And I want you to really take a look at this, that this is the first of what I would call true ap apocalyptical scenes, in that this is a struggle of good versus evil. Right? This is a struggle between the divinity of Jesus and the pitfalls of mankind. This perfection on one hand, and on the other hand, this just short sightedness, the inability to, to see perfection that humanity has before us. And so we look at this and we have to make sure that we understand that this is a true battle. And we live in one today. The more people get involved in their walk with Jesus, they should also be uh, aware of so many of the pitfalls that befall Christians. And for me, as I said before, I really struggle sometimes with this concept of baptism when I hear people talk about it. While it is a washing away of sins, it's not a washing away of trouble. And we often look to Jesus to be a miracle worker. And we want Him somehow to change those stones into bread. We, we're not doing it for uh, the same reason that Satan did. Satan was doing it to test His his divinity, to test His holiness. He wanted Him to do that so that He could show Satan, well, yes, I truly am the Son of God, the Son of Man. I do have that power. I do answer to my Father and the angels answer to me. We want Him to do that. Why? 
Because we want Him to be a miracle worker. We want Him to make our lives different. We want Him to change all things. And that's not how Jesus works. He's not a genie. You don't get to rub the bottle and He comes out and it gives you three wishes. If He did, boy, would our lives be different. And also, I would run out of wishes really, really quick. And so it's not a band-aid. Jesus is not a band-aid. Jesus is a true change in your life. But not necessarily the circumstances. I was recently approached by someone who, who wanted to be baptized. And I asked them what their their desire was. What did they think baptism was going to do? What did they see their baptism as? Are we doing it because family members said you need to do it? Are we doing it because we truly want our sins washed away in, in, a, in a sense as the same way that we've been washed in the blood? Tell me where we're going with this baptism concept. All of a sudden, this popped out of nowhere. You haven't talked about it for years. Now all of a sudden it's important. Why is it important? What are we going to get from this? And the answer that I got was one that centered more around, well, things will be better in my life. My life's going to change. And I said, okay, so what things in your life do you think are going to change? And as they started to lay them out, it was physical things, not spiritual things. It was possessional things not spiritual things. And we have to make sure that we don't fall into that trap. It's very interesting that after we get this from Mark, this, um, this paragraph of verses that talks about Jesus being tempted right after His baptism, it says then, now after John was arrested, right? So we went from a person who is doing God's will, who's going out into the wilderness and baptizing people, and he's baptizing them in God's name. And he tells them what? I am not the one. I'm the one that's coming before Jesus. He will be here soon. So he goes from actively baptizing the Son of Man, the Son of God, and he's arrested. So think about that for a minute. Not only is the person in whom we put our trust and our faith, Jesus Christ, not only does he go from a baptism which is glorious, because John was there, right? Didn't he see the heavens open up too? Didn't he see the Spirit fall upon Jesus? Of course he did. He was standing there right next to him. And just like Jesus went from that to being driven into the wilderness, John went from that being imprisoned. Oh, do you see where I'm going, church? He was put... In prison. He was imprisoned right after he baptized your Lord and Savior. But then Jesus comes. See, Jesus, I'm not the one, but the one is coming behind me. So now Jesus comes to Galilee. And what does it say? He's proclaiming the good news of God. Saying, this time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So follow this chronology again with me, church. Jesus has been in Galilee and He's been doing some preaching, right? He's coming into His own in ministry. And this guy, John, John the Baptist, who's actually his cousin, has been running around, right? baptizing people in the wilderness. He's been out in the hinterlands. He's an irascible guy. He doesn't dress well. He dresses in camel hair. I don't know what that would feel like, but I don't want it, right? He's going out and he's telling all these people, I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father. And the one who is coming is so much more awesome than anything that you could put upon me. If you think that what I'm doing is good stuff, you ain't seen that. Just you, I'm not worthy of what he's going to do and what he's doing. So he's out there doing this, and Jesus comes to fulfill part of that kingdom of God 
in his baptism. And yet, when all of this finishes and transpires, John, the one who came before him, is imprisoned. And we know that as we continue to read Scripture, it didn't work out well for John. Yet, Jesus shows up to Galilee and says, the prophecies have been fulfilled. And I need you now to believe in the good news. Now notice he didn't say, believe in me, I'm the good news. He said, you all need to start believing in the good news. Repent. The time is near. So you're like, okay, Cam, so what do I do with all this? First, understand that these two men not only are connected familially, biologically, right? Not biologically, but you know what I'm talking about. They're connected. And their ministries are connected. And some of the things that people are witnessing, John has witnessed as well. Miracles, and then this, this baptism. I've baptized a lot of people. But the day that I see the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit just envelop us in a way that I can see it, and I see angels at the command, that'll probably be my last day in ministry because the Lord will have called me home from the heart attack that I would have had as I witnessed all of that. And so I just see this. It's a small slice of Scripture. It's, it's not a long passage in Mark's Gospel. And in fact, if we read Matthew's account of it, it's not much longer. But wow, does it have great importance in our life. It, it shows us that we can go from a state of grace and bliss and just a, a pronouncement and an understanding that God is that awesome, that He can just open up, tear open the heavens is what Mark says, and that the Holy Spirit fell upon Jesus. We can go from that to the wilderness. So if Jesus can be put through that, it should not be surprising, church, that we can be put through that as well. And that is why we have to be very, very, very careful about our baptism. Because our baptism is precious. And our baptism is such that we become anew. We become made afresh in that baptism but we also have not been made perfect because that's not the time nor day for it. Our day of perfection comes when we are called home and our name is or is not on the rolls. But until such time, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't reach for perfection, but we should have to truly understand that even Jesus after His baptism was put through challenges by Satan himself. And so if you're in a place right now in your marriage, if you're in a place right now at your job, if you're in a place right now in your health, if you're in a place right now in your uh, humanity where you think that the deck is stacked against you and you think that there are just trials and tribulations falling upon you and that nothing good is going to come of this, let me tell you that there is hope, and hope is in the name of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus, after His baptism, was put to the trials. And so you are no less than what Jesus was going through. Yeah, we're tempted all the time. The devil is right there at our side, whispering over and over again, do this, don't do that, try this, don't try that, and putting you to the test. Well, your divinity is not being put to the test, but maybe your faith is. And when our faith is put to the test, the question is, to whom do we look to? If we are looking for someone or we're looking elsewhere than the cross and in Jesus, our faith is not well-founded. 
And we are going to fall prey to those things that are worldly promises and not be looking at the promise that we've been guaranteed in the name of Jesus. So what do I want you to do with this? I want you to to think about this week what 40 days in the wilderness, some translated as desert. It's arid over there, right? It's not a hospitable place. What 40 days out roaming around would look like. You don't have a backpack of food. There's not a McDonald's nearby. You don't have Gatorade or water that you're taking with you. You're, you're put out immediately. You're put out in the wilderness. And you're roaming around. What kind of things are you going to think of? Are you going to be thinking happy thoughts? Or are you going to maybe be questioning, why am I even here? Now, I truly believe that Jesus' time was a, a, a spiritual place of wandering and an uncertainty. He knew why he was sent. But remember, we haven't gotten to the, the point where he is asking his uh, disciples to pray with him. And we're not yet to the Garden of Gethsemane where he is struggling with his divinity versus his humanity. And he wonders if he should call upon the 10,000 angels to get himself out of it or whether he should go with the flow and do what he was called to do and put on earth to do. I would like to make an argument that's where this, that's, this is where all that starts. It starts with him going from this emancipation, this fulfillment and covering of him with the Holy Spirit and something that is glorious and miraculous and something that is worthy of a small church lunch, right? We're going to celebrate that. That's awesome. And we go immediately from that to a state of what we would see is a lack of grace, a lack of mercy, and to a place in which is troubled. We're out in the wilderness. And so if at this point he is truly uh, in his humanity as a human being, you'd have to look and go, man, this is a mess that I've gotten myself into. And what is it going to take to get me out of this? What is it going to take for me to be made whole? What's, gonna, what's it going to take for me to understand where I've been put? And the answer is the same answer that I would have given Jesus. And that is, it's going to take Jesus. Jesus, church, needed Jesus. And what he got was Jesus. He rebuked Satan three times with temptations that would have taken him out of the situation that he was in. He could have turned stones to bread and he wouldn't have been hungry anymore, right? He could have gone to the top of the spire and called upon angels to catch him as he leaped off. He could have taken all of the kingdom that was offered to him, this worldly kingdom, by Satan, but yet he was rewarded with a kingdom much greater. And so Jesus needed exactly what we need, and that's Jesus. We need him to guide our steps and to illuminate our path, and he needed him to be divine without being divine. His refuting and his rebuke and his rejection of Satan showed his true self. Because in a time in which he was suffering and he could have called upon his divinity, he didn't. And he followed through with the plan. So as we come into Easter, remember that what we are seeing is Jesus showing his divinity by rejecting the comforts that he could have called upon. And so I hope that this helps you start moving in this Lenten season toward a time 
which we call Eastertide. And that what we see here is Jesus rejecting earthly and worldly comforts in order to stay the course and do what he was called to do. This conflict that he finds himself in with Satan is not the last. But it is an illumination for us to understand that Jesus, even in a time in which there was great excitement, there was awesomeness, the Holy Spirit fell upon him, and he was truly falling in and in, in fitting into his calling, his purpose that his father had put before him, that he still had bigger fish to fry. There was still a bigger and higher calling. But just remember, he showed great strength by not accepting comfort. And his divinity was shown not by the command of angels, but by humbling self, himself before his Lord, his Father, our Creator. So we have a lot to be thankful for. And I'm thankful that Jesus, in the middle of temptation, and in the middle of discomfort, in the middle of something that would have been off-putting to us, he took it upon himself to let the devil just keep talking. And so this week, I hope you just let the devil keep talking and rebuke him and reject him and put him off every chance you get because there is a bigger and higher purpose in your life than what you are going through right now. Rest on that. Stand on that. Pray on that. And be blessed by that. Amen? Amen.